it. No, you won't let it! I'm the one who talks! Okay, mouth shut! Ears open! There are several movies that are widely regarded by the general public as boring or garbage films that I quite enjoy. Because of this, I thought that I'd give my opinions on some of them, and seeing as how very few videos on YouTube talk about how great the Matrix sequels are, I thought I'd start there. This will be a two-parter because there is a lot to cover in these two movies, and it'd be unfair to cut them in half. But first, I'd like to make a few points in regards to these films. Whether I'm talking about the Matrix sequels or the Star Wars prequels, one massive argument keeps coming up that really makes me want to bang my head against the wall. The movies are too complicated and not simple enough. In regards to The Matrix, the philosophy aspect of it being dumped on the audience has caused it to be inaccessible to mainstream audiences. Unlike them, however, I quite like films that make me think and study and learn, and therefore I like to go ahead and leave this disclaimer. If thinking for a film hurts you or annoys you, you'll probably not like my stance on this film, and therefore just stop watching and find something you can enjoy. You do not want to see me get out of this chair! Ergo, open your yapper one more time and I'm going to architect a world of pain all over your candy ass! Otherwise, let's begin. One of the biggest problems of this film happens within the first act, and that is the complicated nature of the Oracle speech to Neo, and the quote-unquote terrible CGI of the Smith fight. Let's start in chronological order. Neo seeks out the Oracle's advice in regards to his mission as the One. In so doing, he learns about returning to the Source. Throughout the entire time, there is a talk about choice and determinism, the main central core themes of the trilogy. The Oracle combines the visions of the Source and Trinity falling to the concept of choice. Her answer, something she has stated previously in the conversation, is her only answer. Because you didn't come here to make the choice. You've already made it. You're here to try to understand why you made it. This is truly jaw-droppingly deep, as this perfectly combines both worldviews, something that is done completely in revolutions and foreshadowed here in this moment. In this moment, Neo realizes that the Oracle must be fooling him, or testing him as he questions her and refuses to believe what she's saying. Yet, in the end, it matters little. After the conversation about choice and determinism with the Oracle, Neo is confronted by Mr. Smith, who has returned. He speaks of freedom and how that... We're not here. No, without purpose, it would not exist. As someone who believes in determinism, yes, I know, shocking and ignorant, right? This makes Smith an even more interesting complex villain. From a determinist viewpoint, Smith is pointing out excellent philosophical stances as how we would not exist unless we had a role, a destiny, a fate to partake in. This also shines a light on how he's a true villain as he uses determinism to instill the sense that it is his duty to end Neo and take control of the Matrix for himself. Then the fight scene happens. And although it's cool, and yes, there is some blocky CGI all to us in the modern day, the show of force that Neo must put up is definitely considerable. The most interesting thing is that the number of Smiths attacking Neo keeps growing as more and more pour into the small park. This is a perfect metaphor for the conflict that is being submerged onto Neo's psyche. He has been told by the Oracle that both choice and determinism work hand in hand, while Smith berates him and even forces him to believe in determinism by trying to turn him into a Smith. And as Smiths grow in number, Neo realizes that the conflict cannot be resolved, perhaps due to physical strength. But what if I was to tell you it was because of ignorance? Neo was ignorant of Smith's abilities and his return. Neo was also at the time ignorant of his, on his beliefs and whether he was right, free will, or either Smith, fate slash destiny, or the Oracle deterministic choice were right. In a true ma miniature act, he decides to remove himself from the conflict to gather his thoughts and info before engaging in a battle he is not ready for. Now we move into one of my favorite scenes in the Matrix trilogy, the dinner with the Merovingian. The script for this scene is excellently written, and the acting is superb. Monica Bellucci is perfect in every single way, and so is Lambert Wilson, who plays the devil may care French Merovingian, who is, in his words, I am a trafficker of information. I know everything I can. Another determinist, the Merovingian doesn't see it the way Smith does, but rather as a biological and natural bondage that we are all a part of, and that we cannot choose based on our natural instincts. He uses the example of the reason why they came. He says that, You are here because you were sent here. You were told to come here, and then you obeyed. <laughs> it is, of course, the way of all things. Meaning that they never chose to come, but rather that they had to because the Oracle told them to. 
He further explains that his belief in determinism is causality. Morpheus quickly disagrees with the Merovingian as he unflinchingly states that everything begins with choice. Then the Merovingian delivers my personal favorite line of the film that causes my previous college brain to explode with mind-blowing numbness. No, wrong. Choice is an illusion created between those with power and those without. It is at this point that the Wachowskis decide to follow the Merovingian to give a practical example of this with a woman in a piece of pie. This is yet again the perspective of a determinism, yet set within the framework of natural causality, pressed upon by higher authorities, whether it be a god, a king, or a boss. Neo once again stands for his side of free will and choice, yet it is batted down once more with the Merovingian refusing to give them the keymaker, the person that they are there to retrieve. The Merovingian does this by displaying his philosophy. He is the boss and the guy in charge and therefore is able to control those with less power. That is, of course, until the flawless Persephone gives them the keymaker in exchange for a simple kiss. This is a small moment that displays Neo's sense to duty, something that he is struggles with, and it even proves that Neo is exactly as how the Merovingian said. He needed something, so when an opportunity arose, he took it in order to complete the very thing that the Oracle has ordered them to do. And as we'll see with the architect, that's the breaking point. After Persephone's perfectly amazing help, yes, Monica Bellucci is the highlight of the film for me, Neo, Morpheus, and Trinity have to fight to keep the keymaker. This is a prolonged fight that some might seem too long, but whatever, sorry, your attention spans are too short, apparently. Neo is separated from the rest as he fights for survival. Once having defeated the Merovingian's men, something interesting is stated by the Frenchman. This is foreshadowing the knowledge that will soon be revealed to Neo in the room of the architect. I have survived your predecessors, and I will survive you. After being left stranded without being able to help his friends, Neo starts flying back to them as we cut away to Morpheus, Trinity, and the Keymaker being chased by the twins who can go through solid objects and heal themselves. The battle on the interstate is brought to even higher stakes as the Matrix agents join in the fray. Although the battle and fight is visually stimulating, it isn't until the last part of it that it becomes genuinely interesting. Neo swoops down out of the air as he flies by and saves the lives of, of Morpheus and the Keymaker from an agent that tries to kill them by crashing semis into each other. This is interesting due to the parallel that it has with the major turning point of the trilogy that happens at the end of Reloaded, when Neo must save Trinity from death by the hands of the same agent who tried to kill Morpheus and the Keymaker. In the Matrix, the Keymaker escorts Neo to the source after a tricky maneuver where they have to shut down power across the Matrix city. This wouldn't have been able to have happened without Trinity. Once they have made it to the long and endless hallway, they reach the door they are looking for, but are surprised to find Smith there ready and waiting for them. This is a perfect message sent to the audience that Smith is growing ever omniscient and omnipresent within the Matrix to the point that he can know where Neo is going and how to get there himself. After battling the Smiths, Neo finally flies Morpheus and the Keymaker into the open door. The Keymaker shuts the door as the Smiths open fire, but it's too late to block their attack. He falls to his knees, blood staining his clothes. This might seem pointless or in the right way to see it, it would seem sad and heroic. The Keymaker, although a program, knows that Neo is the one that can save them all from servitude to the machines. He gives his life in order to save him and in order to keep the cause alive. His sacrifice is a foreshadowing of the future sacrifice of the ultimate key, aka Neo, to unlock the chains that bind both humanity and the programs themselves. Both Persephone and the Keymaker are examples of this, and even better ones are given in Revolutions. Then comes the single most infamous scene from the Matrix sequels, The Architect. This dialogue is extremely complicated and convoluted to the point that, upon first watching, it would fly over the viewer's head and make them not understand what is going on. But this is the crux of the trilogy and must be understood. First of all, the complicated nature of the speech. This is done purposefully to show the complexity and knowledge of the machines, and the program that was made and set in place to create the Matrix. Therefore, the fact he does not speak in a more normal fashion is done on purpose to convey a sense of mental superiority. Next, the content of the speech. Firstly, the architect tells Neo that the Matrix has gone through several iterations. Everything that has happened in the past two films have happened before. Zion has been destroyed and rebuilt multiple times, and the prophesied one has come and gone an equal amount of times. This brings Neo to the turning point of the film's end trilogy. He has just learned that everything has happened like this multiple times in order to save humanity from obliteration, even though the consequences are turning them into unknowable slaves. This is exactly what the Merovingian meant by Choice is an illusion created between those with power and those without. Neil must now decide which door to enter. Will he enter the door to reboot the Matrix like his past selves have done multiple times? 
or go through the other one, save Trinity, and bring humanity to possible extinction. The difference this time is Trinity seeing as how apparently no loving relationship had been connected to the one in the past. This tips the scales and causes Neo to pick Trinity to go against common determinist tradition and risk the fate of humanity. By far the interesting part in this, in retrospective, is the fact that the Oracle told Trinity she'd fall for the one, therefore making the Oracle the key force behind Neo's decision. Once again proving the fact that Neo, although under the belief he's choosing, is truly not. He's going by his natural instincts, the instincts that the Oracle told, knew he would follow when he was presented with the two options as the Matrix core. He goes through the door, saves Trinity from death, which mirrors Trinity saving Neo in the previous film, and they return to the real world before being attacked by Sentinels. Neo saves them and then collapses into a coma, and that's the end of the film. Look, if you don't like Reloaded because of the general nitpicks and somehow made it all the way through my video without downvoting it and leaving a nasty comment to prove how intellectually superior you are, uh huh, what up, G? You can't handle it. Then I can respectfully agree to disagree. But I hope, but hopefully, if anything, this video will serve as a positive insight into this film to show you that there is more to it than meets the eye. I mean, in a world of sequels, spin-offs, reboots, politically motivated films, and sometimes entire franchises that try to do all of those things and fails, might I add. It's nice to visit a film that makes you think and analyze it. Is perfect, Reloaded perfect? No. Is it damn good? Absolutely. And hopefully, you'll be willing to stick around for part two, Revolutions. Anyways, guys and gals, thank you so much for watching. Please subscribe and like and comment below. I'm trying to reach 300 subs by the end of the year, and I'm sure you guys can help me out. Thanks, and have a great rest of your day.